good people than when we started. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I, I've been in Portland almost 15 years now. I moved here in 2009. <coughs> Still working on the click here. I moved here in 2009, and for you younger people, 2009... Uh, was two years into the smartphone era. The iPhone had come out in 2007, but it was really expensive, and you had to be locked into an AT&T contract in order to get one. So I didn't have one. Now, it was further along in history that such a thing as GPS existed. I didn't have that either. So if you wanted to know how to get somewhere, you had to look it up online, print out the directions, or remember them carefully, and, and then you could go on your trip. And my grandfather tells the days where you had to buy the books, and good luck figuring that out. But um, I looked online and moved in first day in the apartment with some new roommates I didn't really know, and my parents wanted to bless us with a toaster oven. And hooray, a quick search online told me that there was a store six minutes away that had one. Now, I lived on 89th and Gleason, so right next to the point where 205 and 84 intersect. And so it's easy. You just go up the hill of Gleason, you turn left, you get onto the freeway, 205 north, you take 84 eastbound, and you get off on the 122nd exit. Six minutes. Easy. But for anyone who happens to know that particular intersection, you know that, yeah, we went up the hill of Gleason. My parents are following in the car behind. We turn left to go on the freeway, but this road forks. The left-hand lane goes down, joins with 205 north, in half a mile, you run into 84 eastbound, and you can take the 122nd exit. The other fork in the road is for I-84 westbound. It's a bad wrong turn to take because <laughs> you're stuck on that freeway for a minimum of two and a half miles. And this country kid is used to the exits that you can see the on and off ramp together. It's really simple. Portland didn't make any of those between 205 and, and I-84 uh, and, and I-5. Um, guess which road I got on with my parents following faithfully behind. A few miles in, I realized something has gone wrong here, and so I'm looking for an easy exit. There is no easy exit. And then it splits into I-5 north and south. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't exactly know what I did. I think I took the Lloyd Center exit. Somehow I crossed a bridge over a river and I ended up in Chinatown. <laughs> I am totally lost. <laughs> and we finally meander around downtown Portland until we see a road we recognize, and we get on I-5, oops, going south. <laughs> and we drive until we see something we recognize. 205. <laughs> we are now down in Tualatin. <laughs> As we take 205 all the way back up north to 84 east to 122nd. And the six-minute trip took us over an hour. And in true Jordan fashion, later that day, I made the exact same mistake and realized rather than getting lost, I know that if I just keep driving, I will end up back where I started. So yes, to I-5 south, to Tualatin, to 205 north, (laughs) back to my apartment. Life has gotten much better since then. But just, it highlights the fact that the right lane matters. And for the sake of of conversation in in this morning, I'm going to change this to say the right line matters. The line you're in determines where you're going to go. And this morning, we're going to talk about lines, not the ones you wait in, but actually um, the ones you're descended from. Ancestry, genealogy, lines matter, because here in Genesis chapters 4 and 5, we're going to be introduced to two genealogies thrilling stuff. I know it's your favorite part of the Bible when a bunch of names of people you've never heard of come along and you're like, why in the world did these ancient scribes think that this was so important that they painstakingly by hand faithfully copy this down for thousands of years? (sighs) Well, this morning we're going to, we're going to find out why I'm, I'm excited to remind you of where we've been. God created the world. He ordered it good, right, and perfect. It was beautiful. It was good. It was good. It was very good. And he created the man and put him in an orchard, a garden, a place where food abounded, where man could walk in right relationship with God. But something in this good world 
was not good. It was not good that man should be alone. And so God made a woman. And woe man was that a good day for humankind. And we learn in chapter two. Yeah, I know. Thank you. I get a kick every time. It's awesome. Dad jokes are a thing. Um, And we learned that we were meant for relationship with God and right relationship with one another and a good relationship with creation. Uh, And then things went south. Because in the middle of the garden, there's this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's this creature, a serpent, that begins to call into question God's goodness. Can he be trusted? Does he have your best interests at heart? And you know what would be really good is instead of looking to God to define what is good for you, why don't you seize the ability for yourselves? And seek wisdom in your own power and define for yourself what is good and what is bad. And well, you guys know the story. That's what happened. And everything broke. Our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, our relationship with creation. And man and woman were exiled, banished from the garden so that they could not, in their present state, take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. But God didn't abandon this couple He continues to be in relationship with them. And we come to Genesis chapter 4. But here in in 4 and 5, we're going to see, just a heads up, we're going to see two different lines. The line of the woman and the line of the snake. And this is important because the one glimmer of hope in chapter 3 is that from the offspring of a woman will come someone. A son will be born who's going to crush that serpent's head and have his heel crushed in the process. It's this glimmer of hope. And in light of that, Adam renames his wife Eve, living or life, because from her, um, she will be the mother of all the living. So we have this expectation of of a child to be born. Now in chapter 4, verse 1, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant, and she gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. The name Cain, it, it, it sounds like the Hebrew word for brought forth. And most translations go this direction. Other English translations highlight the fact that there's something interesting going on in the Hebrew. So one of them says, I have gotten the man that the Lord promised. See that? Here's this idea that that Eve thinks this is it. I've just born the child that's going to undo all the wrongness that we brought into the world. Or another way to translate is, I've created a man just as the Lord did. Ha ha! It's boastful and it's arrogant. Look what I did. I've accomplished my own salvation. Now, the reason I highlight this is because at the beginning of chapter 4, a son is born and named. At the end of chapter 4, another son is born and named. And I think that there's an important contrast. I think Eve goes on a journey of understanding between the beginning and the ends of this chapter. So that's why I bring this up. Now, later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, but Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flocks. So one from the field, one from the flock, and and both later are acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. So perhaps if there's a discrepancy, we would say that Abel brought the best. Maybe that's what's going on. Because the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look on with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. You all know the feeling that your brother did better than you did. Well, I know the feeling and I don't like it. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So clearly between the Lord and Cain, there's this understanding that he knew what the right thing to do was and he didn't do it. And now God warns him. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires desires to have you, but you must rule over it. All right, so we have a new word that's been introduced into the scriptures right now, sin. It's a word, as a verb, it means like to miss the mark, or to to carry a, a stain. It's used in several different ways. This is the first thing we learn about it, that this sense of offness is like a monster at the gates, like a predator lurking in the dark, waiting to take you under its control. Look out, it wants to have you, but you must rule over it. And these words, desire and rule, 
It is the same pairing that's used in chapter 3 when God tells the woman, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. From now on, men and women, you guys are going to be at each other's throats trying to dominate one another in this relationship. And things will be broken between you. Now, those same words show up in the relationship between sin and Cain. Look out, Cain, God warns him. Well, God has warned a person earlier in the story. It didn't go too well. Will Cain be the one to listen to God and to trust him, or will he choose something different? Let's see. Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, hey, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. Oof. I told you that Cain, his name sounds like the Hebrew word for brought forth. I haven't told you about Abel's name. It's the same word that's used later in the book of Ecclesiastes when the preacher says, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Vanity of vanities. Abel, Hevel. It's like a word for smoke, something that appears to be substantial and you reach for it and it's gone. Abel, the one who is and, and then wasn't. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Does God know? Yeah. But like he did last time, God comes with questions. Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Is it my job to keep him under lock and key? Again with denial, again with, sh again with shifting. And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Can't you hear it? Now you're under a curse and you're driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain, you were a tiller of the soil. You were a farmer, but now you've forced the ground, its mouth open and made it drink the blood of your brother. It will no longer cooperate with you. You have broken trust with the land, so to speak. And you're going to wander. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence, from your face. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Cain thinks this is a death sentence. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. Again, as we see in the story, when faced with human rebellion and sin, God comes announcing the consequences, but he also comes with compassion and mercy. Cain, you're not going to die. I'm going to protect you. And so Cain went out from the Lord's presence, and he lived in the land of Nod, the land of wandering east of Eden. And Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. I don't know about you, but to me, I can't imagine something as polar opposite to wandering the world compared to building a city. <laughs> it's like Cain has thrown off any idea of, of listening to what God has said. Like, forget that, God. I'm going to establish myself in one place. And he named it after his son, Enoch. And to Enoch was born Irad. Irad was the father of Mahujael. Mahujael was the father of Methushael. And Methushael was the father of Lamech. All right, pro tip. When you have to pronounce biblical names, act like you know what you're doing and go for it. Because <laughs> no one really knows how these things are supposed to be pronounced. All right? <laughs> and it's okay. So a bunch of names, we don't know, but we get to a guy named Lamech. Now, Lamech married two women. Oh. One named Ada and the other Zillah. And Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. Those are bad names for brothers. It's too, far too close. You're going to get them confused all the time. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who play stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah, the other wife, also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron, and Tubal Cain's sister was Naama. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice. 
Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged 77 times, <laughs> then Lamech is avenged 77 times. Let's talk about this dude for a minute. All right, he married two women. Yes, uh, the word there is took. He took two women. Same word for Adam and Eve, took of the fruit. He's acquiring them like property. He's living outside of God's standard of, of a man and his wife for life. Second thing is his sons are the inventors of culture, of industry, of art, music, technology, human flourishing. And so during the time of <clears throat> sexual freedom, if you will, freedom from what God says is good for a man, and during the time of cultural freedom, of, of art and, and music and industry and technology, you have alongside it someone who is boastful and arrogant and excessively violent, who takes upon himself the idea like, I'm going to kill someone just for hurting me. If God's going to avenge Cain seven times, then Lamech will be avenged 77 times. And something to know about Lamech, he is the seventh from Adam in the line of Cain. That number seven will be significant later on. Now we're going to leave the story of Cain and his offspring, and the narrator brings our attention back to Adam. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth sounds like the name for granted. Where she began the story, I have born a man just like the Lord did. Now she realizes, oh, Cain is not the serpent crusher's son. I was hoping he'd be. I can't do it on my own. I cannot save myself. God has granted me another son in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son. He named him Enoch. He named him mortal or frail. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. At that time, people began to recognize they cannot save themselves, and they have to look to God to rescue them from the plight that they have found themselves in. Welcome to chapter 5. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them, and he named them mankind since when they were created. And when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness and his own image, and he named him Seth. So God created man in his image, and then this man has a son in his image. God is the original father of us all. And after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years, and then he died. I'm going to see a pattern established here. Let's see how quickly you guys can pick up on it. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. After he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived a total of 912 years and then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. After he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 850 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enosh lived a total of 905 years, and then he died. Do we have the pattern? All right, we're going to do these next slides quicker. Kenan became the father of Mahalalel, and then he died. Mahalalel became the father of Jared, and then he died. Jared became the father of Enoch, and then he died. All right, same, same format, different years that they're living. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Whenever you're reading something and you notice a pattern, and then something comes along that breaks the pattern, pay close attention. Enoch walked with God. He doesn't die. It's almost like he found a way back to the tree of life. 
that God somehow rescued this man from death, this man who walked faithfully with God. That's important to pay attention to. Methuselah fathered Lamech, and then he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, he will comfort us in the labor and the painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. Noah sounds like the words for comfort or rest. Here's here's a child who's going to uh, lift the burden of the curse from us. This is a promised son we're looking for, we're hoping for. And after Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years. He had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Lamech lived a total of 777 years. Or, Or in Hebrew, it's actually 77 and 700. We have another Lamech associated with multiples of seven. And then he died. And after Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right. The only other person in the storyline so far that we're told had three sons is Adam, Cain, Abel, Seth. Now Noah, the 10th generation from Adam, has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This will be important, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word. We're going to stop here. This is the only genealogy in the scriptures that I'm aware of, and, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, that has ages. It's almost like the biblical author kind of wants us to do math. And so a quick Google Google search showed me that a bunch of people have done it for me, all right? (laughs) This is a respect of ages and timelines. And Enoch sticks out like a sore thumb. And then then there's this really interesting event that's going to happen the very year that Methuselah dies, or, or perhaps precipitating that. Something where Noah will be the only person continuing on. We'll get to that next week. So... Two genealogies, thrilling stuff, I I know. What do we see? One thing we see is that the hoped-for offspring fails to arrive. Could it be Cain? Oh, no. No. Far from being the serpent crusher, he is firmly in the grips of that darn serpent. We see sin as a predator looking to destroy life and the need, the warning that we must rule it. We see that the ground is polluted by blood, refusing to work for the one who defiled it. And if Cain is banished from the land because of one innocent man whose blood was shed, like what might happen when you have an entire city characterized by violence and bloodshed? Or a whole nation of it? We see again humanity moves east of Eden, Further away from the presence of God in light of sin, east is a bad direction, biblically speaking. We see a younger son exalted over his older brother. Seth replaces not Cain, but Abel, the younger son who is privileged. We'll see this pattern throughout the book of Genesis. We also see the further fallout of sin. Death has come into the world and that humanity will be unable to save itself. We go from, I've gotten a child, just like the Lord, to no God has granted me, another son. And people begin to call on the name of the Lord. Prayer has begun. We see two lines, the line of the serpent and the line of the woman. And these are bloodlines, but, but not really. As we move through the, the story of the Bible, we'll find out that these are more like theological lines. These are the lines of, of the choices that each one of us face. Will we trust God, listen to him, and, and live in line of what he says is good, or will we choose for ourselves? Will we listen to the serpent and be one of his children? Or will we be part of the line of the woman from which hope for the world will come? And the seventh, number seven in each of these lines in these two stories exemplifies what this line is all about. You have Lamech, the line of Cain. Violence, taking whatever you see for yourselves as good, be they women or otherwise. During the time when human culture is flourishing and you're the powerful man at the top of the heap, you can take what you want. And, and force anyone to your will. Or you can be like Enoch, who walked with God. He never dies. He found a way to eternal life. Somehow, some way, God took him. What line do we want to be in? 
One line lives apart from God. They flourish culturally. They're characterized by violence, sexual perversion, or deviancy, or indulgence. And the other line recognizes their need for God's salvation. They walk with him, and they look for a promised son who's going to remove the curse and grant rest. Could it be Noah? Maybe. It's been a long time living under the curse. This one will give us rest and comfort. So my point this morning, family of grace, is that it matters what line we're in. Because the line we're in will determine our ultimate destiny, our ultimate future. And each of us, we're given a choice. <clears throat> we can live life on our own terms. We can find satisfaction in cultural pursuits. And we can live with the reality of violence, greed, and indulgence. Choose your own adventure. Or as our culture likes to say, you do you. Disney will say, follow your heart. Pursue your dreams. Cancel anyone who refuses to lift you up and affirm the choices that you're making in your life. You decide what is good for yourself, and then you just let all the rest of us know, and we'll affirm it. Find your satisfaction in, in, in thriving business, and making money, and becoming popular, and becoming great, and becoming talented, and, and, and experiencing pleasure. And just know that since this world doesn't matter and God isn't a factor, um, you know, those who are rich and powerful and have means will continue to take from those who don't. Um, it's just, you know, hopefully you're at the top of the heap and not the bottom. But the biblical story will warn us that that's a bad road to take. There are severe consequences that come because God cares about people and God cares about this world that he's made. So um, heads up next week, um, we're going to see the consequences of this kind of life. Or, or we can recognize our inability to save ourselves. We can call on the Lord to save us. We can hope for the promised son, and we can choose to walk with God and be blessed by it. Obviously, very clearly, guys, this is the right one to take. Um, but we do have a choice. It matters what line we're in. So this morning, my hope is that we would get in the right line. And that as people who live in this line, the line of those who trust God, we would be characterized by what this line is characterized by. We would repent of our sin instead of deny it, instead of let it consume us. We would hope in God instead of finding our satisfaction elsewhere. And that we would walk with God instead of hiding from him and moving far away from his presence. So let's talk about repenting of sin. Repenting, it's this Christian word. We use it all the time. Um, but no one else uses it, so it just means to turn around, like you're going the wrong direction, find a way to turn around and come back. Repent of sin, repent of life on human terms instead of life on God's terms, and don't let it master us. It's a predator, it's an enemy at the gate, it's a monster that wants to have you. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say each one of you knows what it's like, that you know those times when you're like, I'm going to make a good decision. And then you wake up the next morning and you go, that was a terrible decision. What happened? And the biblical authors would say, yeah, you fell prey to sin. That as Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil runs through the middle of every human heart. That every single one of us has the capacity inside of us to betray all that we hold dear. That, that our own desires can master us. I know what that's like. I've been mastered by, by two sins in my life. You know, may the Lord keep that number only at two. Uh, but, you know, my addictions to sin, my addictions to bulimia, like, they had mastery over me. They controlled me. And I did a lot of things that I really regret. And the solution, the antidote to letting sin control you is to fight against it, to kill it somehow, some way. But it's not something that stays dead. It's something that we have to be constantly vigilant against. So, first of all, be aware. <laughs> Beware. We have an enemy inside of us. And so let us soberly, carefully, and also boldly live life together, being watchful of ourselves and one another, knowing that, that if we're not careful, uh, we, can, we can be our own worst enemy, and we can hurt those who are around us. Let us confess our sins and temptations to one another. Let's not hide Let's not deny or deflect. Let us just own it and carry our shame out into the open, trusting that God is able to take what is broken and to restore it. That God is the one who offers forgiveness. That God is the one who can atone or cover over our shame 
in our wrongness. This is where Jesus comes in. We need him to do this. And because he has done it, fast forward in the story a long ways, um, we can be free of this. This is how we live differently. We need to put our hope in God and wait for the promised one. First thing to realize, life is short. That barring Jesus coming back, I will die and you will die. And everything that we have accumulated and all of the stuff that we keep in our extra storage unit that we never access will one day go to other people. And, all right, quick question here. Can anyone tell me the name of their great-great-grandparents? Okay, I, I see four hand, five hands out of the entire room. For those who didn't raise your hand, would you be willing to admit, which of you care that I don't really know their names? Does it really matter? Most of us, not really. Yeah. For most of us, you know, even our great-great-grandparents are, are people not really worth our time. They're, they're gone. They're dead. They're not around anymore. We will die. Our life is short. So what do we do here that matters? See, cultural pursuits, power, pleasure cannot save us. Sure, we can find satisfaction now, but the consistent testimony of wise people when at the end of their life as they look back and say, all these things that I've labored for my entire life, I look back and say, why? It doesn't really matter. A guy named Malcolm Muggeridge writes this. He says, when I look back on my life nowadays, which I sometimes do, what strikes me most forcibly about it is that what seemed at the time most significant and seductive seems now most futile and absurd. For instance, success in all of its various guises, being known and being praised, ostensible pleasures like acquiring money or seducing women, or traveling, going to and fro in the world and up and down in it like Satan, exploring and experiencing whatever Vanity Fair has to offer. In retrospect, all these exercises and self-gratification seem pure fantasy, what Pascal called licking the earth. They are diversions designed to distract our attention from the true purpose of our existence in this world, which is, quite simply, to look for God. And in looking, to find Him. And having found Him, to love Him. Thereby establishing a harmonious relationship with His purposes for His creation. We also need to recognize oops, that we cannot force or hurry God's blessings. We have to wait for him to do it. We see, we see the story of Eve kind of hinting that way, that she says, look what I've done. But later on in the book of Genesis, we'll see the disastrous effects of men and women who try to hurry God's blessings and God's promises. It never works, and it only ends badly. We have to wait for him. Wait, my soul, for God alone. And now for us who know the ending of the story, we know the name of this promised son. If you would choose what is good, what God says is ultimately good, then, then you have to believe in Jesus. This is where we find our satisfaction. This is where we find our life. This is where life actually has meaning because he's the one who grants access to eternal life that does not end in death. He walks with God. He crushes the serpent's head. He worships properly. He removes the curse. We need to trust him. And if you haven't made that decision, I'd invite you Maybe today would be the day that you'd choose to trust in Jesus. And of course, we need to walk with God, not hide from him. God is not as offended by our sin as we think he is. He comes out and engages in relationship with Adam and Eve after their sin and with Cain after his sin. And the glorious story of the Bible is that God pursues those who have rebelled and walked away from him. And he does everything he possibly can to bring them home. So would we choose to walk with God and just maybe, maybe walking with him leads to eternal life like Enoch found? So the first thing I'd say, if you want to know what it looks like to walk with God, get to know him. Read the scriptures, pray, talk to him, fellowship with other believers and worship. And no, I'm not just coming up with this. Later in the story, the first chapter of the church's life says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching about Jesus and God found now in the scriptures and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, communion, worship, and to prayer. We should thank God daily for Jesus, the one who is undoing all that is broken in ourselves and in the world. 
and we should follow the way of Jesus. So as we say at Family of Grace, we, we try to love Jesus, and we want to love like Jesus. So we follow the way of Jesus by imitating him through loving the way that Jesus does. And so of all the ways that we can imitate Jesus today, I want to highlight one specific one. In John 13, Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John, in one of his letters later, he says, we love because he first loved us. And whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they've seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. He's given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Okay, don't be like Cain. Don't kill a sibling. It's a bad way to go. Rather, look at the person next to you and love them, which is more than just a feeling, sure. It's an action. How can I bless them? How can I use what, what I have right now to, to work for their good? Go home to your roommate, to your spouse, to your children, and say, how can I bless them? Why? Because God has blessed me, because Jesus has blessed me, and I want to follow him. Look to your neighbors. Maybe there's a way you can help them out. Bring the blessings of God and share it with others. It is, it is the antidote <laughs> to the way of Cain, which is all about me. And the line of Seth says, no, it's all about we, us, God, and the people of God together. Because we have a choice. Again, you can follow your dreams. You can follow your heart. You can do you. And you can live life however you want to. But bad things will come from it. They always do. Or we can call on the Lord for help and we can hope in him and we can walk with God. And here's the promise. Blessings will come. Because we already know in the story that we have a God that loves to bless humanity. That's what he wants to do. It's what he's been doing from the very beginning. How can I bless you? And the problem is we as people refuse to be blessed on God's terms. And we insist on having it on ours. Phillips Brooks writes, Someday in the years to come, you will be wrestling with a great temptation or trembling under the great sorrow of your life. But the real struggle is here, now, in these quiet weeks. Now it is being decided whether in the day of your supreme sorrow or temptation you shall miserably fail or gloriously conquer. Character cannot be made except by a steady, long-continued process. We get in a lane, and that lane leads us to a destination. So the answer is start today. And choose today, where will we be? And what kind of behaviors will we live in? And my hope is that we live in the characters of the right line and be blessed. Because God has a plan to save this world that he's made that we broke. That plan is coming to fruition in Jesus. And he wants us to be part of his family and to be part of his story. Would we let him bless us today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for the way that you have walked with us, um, if we would let you. God, thank you that um, you know our sins, you know our shame. God, you know my, my pride and my arguments with my wife and my kids and every, every way that I've blown it this last week. Um, and you love me still. You love each one of us still. That there is no, nothing that we can do that is so bad that we put ourselves beyond your power of redemption, beyond your reach. And so, Lord, we would trust that and we would believe it. Help us to find our life and our security and our joy in living uh, according to your path, in following your Son, in trusting you for salvation. God, let us not trust human pursuits. Let us not trust whoever is going to be elected to the governor's office here in the state of Oregon um, because humans can't save us, because government can't save us, because cultural pursuits will not save us. The only thing that can save us and can truly restore this world is you. Um, and what you're doing through your son, Jesus Christ. So we want to believe in you today. We want to honor you and glorify you and give you proper, acceptable worship that would please you right now. Holy Spirit, would you help us to do that? In Christ's name we pray, amen.